Clarity on Fire, a podcast for people who know what they don't want out of their life and career, but aren't sure what they'd rather be doing. In a world where it's easy to exist, but hard to feel alive, we, Kristen and Rachel, two certified life and career coaches, are here to help you cut through the information overload, get unstuck, and focus not just on how you can have a career you're passionate about, but how to create a whole life that feels fulfilling. So join us here, where we serve up inspiration and down-to-earth wisdom in a way that only two best friends can. We want you to experience the relief of knowing that, yes, you're allowed to want more out of your life and career. And no, you don't have to wander through the dark anymore. Our job is to light the fire that shows you the way. Let's go. Hello, we're back. We for are. part two. Oh yeah. And we are jumping in real deep, real fast. So oh, no. if you if you somehow got to this episode and you didn't listen to part one, I'm just gonna pause you and say, go You gotta go back to part and part one. This is not gonna make a ton of sense if you're jumping in and this is the first thing you're listening to. Um, so we talked about what trauma is, some ways that it shows up, and now we're gonna be getting into treatments and healing. But be- before we get to healing, we have two things we want to cover, like healing. And But before that, we're going to talk about the limitations of kind of like the standard way that mental illness and trauma have traditionally been treated. Mm-hmm. Because I, in reading this book, there were so many things that angered me, frustrated mm-hmm. me, validated things that I've been thinking for a long time about how poorly we treat these issues in this country, but I think just in the world. I think some countries are doing it better than America. Um, But I really feel strongly about this because I think that a lot of us put our trust in expertise. I think it's really critical to remember that every generation uncovers new things. What was once accepted practice becomes something we laugh at. And we know this when we look back many hundreds of years at like, Bloodletting. Oh, yeah. Like leeches. Not and... cleaning your tools before doing surgery on someone. Right. There's things that were like, that was not a great idea, but at the time was conventional practice. And, if and you... everyone just uh, believed that that was what was needed to treat the illness. Not only that, but if you went against it, you were crazy. Uh huh. You were potentially a witch. Yep. Witches got burned at the stake. So I want you to remember that's still happening now. Like, the we're thing... not perfect no. at treatments now. We're a lot better than where we were. For sure. But don't think that we have it all figured out now because I'm not sure we're ever going to have it all figured out. And something like mental illness and trauma, that's particularly challenging to understand. It's not quite as straightforward as some other medical things. So we're definitely still in the learning phase as a society. Well, and psychology itself is a rather new field compared to some. True. Yes. So, okay. Wow. Speaking of things that the establishment used Got to um, deeply, buy into. Deeply wrong. Very wrong. How about this? Uh, okay, so when confronted with many, many patients who spoke about sexual abuse in their families, our, the, the, the author of this book was puzzled because all the psychiatry textbooks that he was reading, typically ones that were from the, eight, the, the, sorry, the 1980s, we're saying that incest was extremely rare, as in like one in a million was the statistic that he was seeing. Furthermore, he reads in this textbook, there is little agreement about the role of father-daughter incest as a source of serious subsequent psychopathology. Okay. I, I'm, I'm like yeah. taking a breath before I read sure. this next part. Okay. It literally went on to say that such incestuous activity dis- diminishes the subject's chance of psychosis and allows for a better adjustment to the external world. I just want to like pause and just let really that one think sink about in. a psychiatry that. textbook endorsed incest. Actually in- thinks it helps you become a more well-adjusted, less mentally screwed up person. And this was uh-huh. only 40 years ago. So, you know, just question. Uh-huh. From whom you get your information. And uh, if you're going to a really old psychiatrist, ask when's the last time they read a textbook. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Because seriously, seriously people practicing this was now. the 80s, the right, 1980s. People practicing then are still practicing now. Yes. 
And even just, even if we just break it down to the stats, they're saying one in a million people has experienced right. incest. And Dr. Dr. Bessel van Vander Kolk. Kolk. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a mouthful of a name. Okay. Uh, he's like, how am I seeing like all of the people? If that's truly the statistic, I I'm be seeing, seeing like all right. of them. I shouldn't And that doesn't make any sense. Them. So right. that's just always question, is this, feeling accurate in my experience. Yeah. So also in 2011, okay, we're talking nine years ago, he tried to get something called, something he kind of coined called developmental trauma disorder added to the DSM, which is the famous diagnostic manual for mental health issues. Um, The American Psychiatric Association said, and I quote, the notion that early childhood adverse experiences lead to substantial developmental disruptions is more clinical intuition than a research-based fact. There is no known evidence of developmental disruptions that were preceded in time in a causal fashion by any type of trauma syndrome. The American Psychiatric Association decided that trauma had, there was no real correlation or way that you could prove, even though he's like, um, did you look at all the research like, I submitted I've to done you? all of these studies to right. prove that very thing, but they're not convinced. They think it's just like... Yeah. So speaking of shade that he throws at the DSM, he could not... I mean, this was one of the only times I laughed in this book because it's so heavy, but he absolutely like just side eyes and shades the the the, the American Psychiatric <laughs> Association in real form and here's here's okay. here's more of that Speaking for you. Speaking of that. Yeah. When DSM-5, so the fifth version, was published in May 2013, it included some 300 disorders in its 945 pages. It offers a veritable smorgasbord of possible labels for the problems associated with severe early life trauma including some new ones, such as disruptive mood regulation disorder, non-suicidal self-injury, intermittent explosive disorder, dysregulated social engagement disorder, and disruptive impulsive control disorder. Before the late 19th century, doctors classified illnesses according to their surface manifestations, like fevers and pustules, which was not unreasonable, given that that was pretty much all they had to go on. This changed when scientists like Louis Pasteur and Robert Koch discovered that many diseases were caused by bacteria that were invisible to the naked eye. Medicine then was transformed by its attempts to discover ways to get rid of those organisms rather than just treating the boils and the fevers that they caused. With DSM-5, psychiatry firmly regressed to early 19th century medical practice. Despite the fact that we know the origin of many of the problems it identifies, its diagnoses, which is in quotes, describe surface phenomena that completely ignore the underlying causes. Even before DSM-5 was released, the American Journal of Psychiatry published the results of validity tests of various new diagnoses, which indicated that the DSM largely lacks what in the new in the world of science is known as reliability. <laughs> Throwing some shade. I mean, I love in it. the world of science. It's, how about just in the world, like reliable information? <laughs> the ability to produce consistent, replicable results. In other words, it lacks scientific validity. Oddly, the lack of reliability and validity did not keep the DSM-5 from meeting its deadline for publication, despite the near universal consensus that it represented no improvement over the previous diagnostic system. Could the fact that the APA had earned $100 million on the DSM-4 and is slated to take on a similar amount with the DSM-5, because all mental health practitioners, many lawyers, and other professionals will be obligated to purchase the latest edition, be the reason we have this new diagnostic system? I wonder if you follow the money, if you'll find your answer. Uh Uh-huh. So they're just rushing this thing to print, not caring Mm -hmm. if this is actually helping people better Mm -hmm. understand their diagnoses and treatment, just whatever is going to get them a new book and a whole bunch of new money. Also, even if they weren't doing it for money, even if something is not scientifically, you know, reliable, why are we printing it? Why are we having people 
diagnosed according to something that is literally proven to be unreliable. So this is a good, we're going to get into this more in a second, but this is a really good thought. If you've been diagnosed with something, I'm not saying question your diagnosis, but I am saying, are you being treated for the symptom? Are you Mm -hmm. actually being treated for the root cause? Because trauma is often at the heart of all sorts of disparate, um, you know, diagnoses on the surface. And any psychiatrist might give you a slightly different diagnosis, but it's all based in the same core thing. Mm -hmm. So, okay, in essence, question the establishment. There have been societal backlashes every time the establishment has been asked to question the status quo. He talks about how PTSD, when it used to be known as shell shock, people were punished for even discussing it. Mm. Obviously, incest used to be not such a bad thing, according to the textbook. Maybe even a good thing. And more recently, there's been similar backlash about repressed memories being fake. You see this mm-hmm. in, the, in the news. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Like, and in, and in uh, um, legal cases. And he gives an example about like the Catholic priests and the sexual abuse yeah. and how a lot of the defendants have been, um, you know, kind of lambasted for, oh, they're just making that up. The repressed memories aren't real. Mm-hmm. Um, by the way, they're totally a thing. Uh, I'm going to read something to you about that. Um, There have, in fact, been hundreds of scientific publications spanning well over a century documenting how the memory of trauma can be repressed only to resurface years or decades later. Memory loss has been reported in people who have experienced natural, natural disasters, accidents, war trauma, kidnapping, torture, concentration camps, and physical and sexual abuse. Total memory loss is most common in childhood sexual abuse with incidents ranging from 19 to 38%. This issue is not particularly controversial. As early as 1980, the DSM-3 actually recognized the existence of memory loss for traumatic events in the diagnostic criteria for dissociative amnesia. An, An inability to recall important personal information, usually of a traumatic or stressful nature, that is too extensive to be explained by normal forgetfulness. Memory loss has been part of the criteria for PTSD since that diagnosis was first introduced. So not only do you question the establishment of like, you know, the DSM, but even when something is in the DSM, the culture and media can, you know, spin a narrative and make you question whether something is true because it doesn't fit with the cultural narrative. Mm -hmm. So it's not just one establishment you got to question. You got to question a lot of establishments in order to get healthy. Okay, so along those same notes, here's here's another piece. Given the wealth of evidence that trauma can be forgotten and resurfaced years later, which like everyone's saying, oh, there's no evidence. He's like, yeah, there's evidence. There's a wealth of evidence. It's not even controversial. No. Why did nearly 100 reputable memory scientists from several different countries throw the weight of their reputations behind the appeal to overturn over Father Shanley's conviction. Father this Shanley was, a, was one of the Catholic priests yes. convicted of, of molesting little boys, claiming that repressed memories were based on quote-unquote junk science because memory loss and delayed recall of traumatic experiences had never been documented in the laboratory. Some cognitive scientists adamantly denied that these phenomena existed or that retrieved traumatic memories could be accurate. However, what doctors encounter in emergency rooms, on psychiatric wards, and on the battlefield is necessarily quite different from what scientists observe in their safe and well-organized laboratories. Yeah, so people will hide behind, well, you can't measure it, (laughs) or you can't like produce a study about it like you can for that thing, which is not to say there is not plenty of evidence for something being valid, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, In case we haven't made it particularly clear, I want to go back to, he's not a fan, like, to say the least, of labeling, like, or giving someone a diagnosis based on symptoms. Like, creating a disorder based on symptoms um, has a lot of limitations. Mm -hmm. I'm going to read something to you if I can actually get my page in order. (laughs) If we look beyond the list of symptoms, or specific symptoms that entail formal psychiatric diagnoses, we find that almost all mental suffering involves either trouble in creating workable and satisfying relationships or difficulties in regulating arousal, as in the case of habitually becoming enraged, shut down, overexcited, or disorganized. Usually, it's a combination of both. The standard medical focus on trying to discover the right drug to treat a particular disorder 
tends to distract us from grappling with how our problems interfere with our functioning as members of a tribe. Like, that, it's as simple as that. We're trying to focus on, well, what is the drug or what do we actually mm-hmm. call it? And it's like, can we actually focus on the root of the problem and helping this person create satisfying relationships and calming their nervous system down. He wants true healing. This man is absolutely here to figure out how can we best heal the person at their core, not just find a convenient label and, you know, essentially kind of like throw drugs at the symptoms. That's not at all his approach. Here's a good um, example of that in action. Okay. Anthony was only two and a half when he referred to when he was referred to our trauma center by a child care center because its employees could not manage his constant biting and pushing, his refusal to take naps, and his intractable crying, head banging, and rocking. He did not feel safe with any staff member and fluctuated between despondent collapse and angry defiance. When we met with him and his mother, he anxiously clung to her, hiding his face while she kept saying, Don't be such a baby. He startled when a door banged somewhere down the corridor and then burrowed deeper into his mom's lap. When she pushed him away, he sat in a corner and started to bang his head. He just does that to bug me, his mother remarked. When we asked her about her own background, she told us that she'd been abandoned by her parents and raised by a series of relatives who hit her, ignored her, and started to sexually abuse her at age 13. She'd become pregnant by a drunken boyfriend who left her when she told him she was carrying his child. Anthony was just like his father, she said, a good for nothing. She had had numerous violent rows with subsequent subsequent boyfriends, but she was sure that this had happened too late at night for Anthony to notice. If Anthony were admitted to a hospital, he would likely be diagnosed with a host of different psychiatric disorders, depression, oppositional defiant disorder, anxiety, reactive attachment disorder, ADHD, and PTSD. None of these diagnoses, however, would clarify what was wrong with Anthony, that he was scared to death and fighting for his life and he did not trust that his mother could help him. That's it. That's it. That's what, that's, that's Anthony's problem. You don't need to (laughs) say, you know, he bangs his head and he's anxious. And he has oppositional defiant disorder. Let's treat it. Like, there's a good reason for that. And here's the good reason for that. Let's maybe focus on healing that Of course, that poor girl was not a capable mother. How could she be? She had no model. Right. And she was also traumatized. Severely traumatized. I mean, it just breaks my heart. So he also says that it would be a lot more helpful if instead of just like creating symptoms-based labels for diagnoses, like oppositional defiant disorder or reactive attachment Mm -hmm. or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, right? That... You organize them according to specific patterns of brain activation. He said, it'd be more compelling to categorize mental illness according to the underlying patterns, which you can measure on an EEG, Mm -hmm. that correlate with symptoms like confusion, agitation, disembodiment. I think that makes so much more sense. If you want to label something, there are actual patterns in your brain that, you know, can be grouped together. And then according to how the pattern is showing up internally, that's what we try to treat. Of course, we're getting, that's getting more internal instead of just the expression of the brain pattern, which probably looks very different for different people and is not as helpful, frankly. Okay, so what about drugs? Because we know that that's the go-to treatment for a lot of people. We are a very medicated society. Yes, we are with anxiety, with depression, with a whole host of psychological disorders or for mental illness. And he was one of the first people, actually, to do extensive research on the effectiveness of Prozac. And he noted that he got a lot of improvement in his patients, but he's not a fan on the whole, and this is not going to surprise you based on everything else we've said, of treating mental health as if it's just a chemical imbalance brain disease. So yeah. he doesn't want to just focus on rebalancing chemicals because the vast, vast majority of the time, the reason there's a chemical imbalance in the first place is because of a traumatic past. Yeah, that you there need has to, to be a holistic approach. Drugs can be helpful in calming your nervous system down, in helping um, you know make your body more receptive to healing. But mm-hmm. it, in and of itself, is not a cure all, and it's not going to heal anything. It's symptom relief. Yes. Again, it's not actually getting at the core yes. of what caused the imbalance in the first place. So, to that end, he says. 
The brain disease model overlooks four fundamental truths. One, our capacity to destroy one another is matched by our capacity to heal one another. Restoring relationships and community is central to restoring well-being. Two, language gives us the power to change ourselves and others by communicating our experiences, helping us to define what we know, and finding a common sense of meaning. Three, we have the ability to regulate our own physiology, including some of the so-called involuntary functions of the body and brain, through some basic activities like breathing, moving, and touching. Four, we can change social conditions to create environments in which children and adults can feel safe and where they can thrive. When we ignore these quintessential dimensions of humanity, we deprive people of ways to heal from trauma and restore their autonomy. Being a patient rather than a participant in one's healing process separates suffering people from their community and alienates them from an inner sense of self. Given the limitations of drugs, I started to wonder if we could find more natural ways to help people deal with their post-traumatic responses. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just so true. Like, you take someone who's been traumatized and you give them drugs, but you don't do any talk therapy with them. You don't help change their home environment. You know, you're not doing them any good. You're you're treating them in this isolated fashion as if they're not a part of a broader system. Mm -hmm. And he's all about, like, the holistic system approach to healing. Right. Okay, so you mentioned talk therapy. So that's one of the potential, uh, you know, routes of healing. And even that has limitations as well. Um, we kind of got into that a little bit earlier for people who can't articulate their feelings. That's hard enough to try to do right. talk therapy. Right. But uh, what, another limitation that he describes as a conventional path of talk therapy is that when you try to rationalize with someone who is suffering the results of trauma it just doesn't work. Appealing to their logical brain to understand it from a from a rational perspective, that's typically not going to be very helpful. So yeah. for example, he was trying to help a patient of his named Kathy, and she was blaming herself for bringing on her father's sexual abuse. She was seven. Right. When, for, when she was started to be abused. So, to me. okay. And so he told her, you know, you're just a small child. You could not have been responsible for anything. And she responded to him, which I thought was actually very astute of her. She said, when you try to talk to me, to when you try to talk me into being more reasonable, I only feel more lonely and isolated. It confirms the feeling that nobody in the whole world will ever understand what it feels like to be me. Yeah. I remember reading that, that section and she, you know, she said things like, I understand that I am not responsible intellectually, but when you say that, it doesn't actually validate how I feel because right. I still feel right. responsible. Right. You can't talk yourself out of being traumatized. So what I took from this section was sometimes just validating someone's experience, even if it's incorrect, but for them, that makes perfect sense. That's a lot more helpful than just trying to talk them out of it. Well, okay. Okay. We're going to move on to the healing portion now. So that was the limitations portion. I hope we've given you a lot of food for thought about <laughs> question where you're getting your information, question the approach, question whether the diagnosis is more of a symptoms-based treatment or whether you're actually being treated in a holistic way. Just use your critical thinking to, and I think we all have it, even traumatized people, like we can access some critical thinking. Yes. And you can just trust what even things that work for other people might not work for you. There are individual sure. limitations we'll as well. We'll get into so, that in a minute. So yeah, just be, pay attention to what is actually feeling like relief. But speaking of feeling validated, he shares like the, one of the, this is the first point I have when it comes to healing trauma. Mm -hmm. He says, quite simply, being able to feel safe with other people is probably the single most important aspect of mental health. Social support is the most powerful protection against becoming overwhelmed by stress and trauma. I mean, right there, that's again, that validation piece, feeling not alone in your suffering. So just to do, dive a little bit more into that, social support is not the same as merely being in the presence of others. The critical issue is reciprocity, being truly heard and seen by the people around us, feeling that we are held in someone else's mind and heart. For our physiology to calm down, heal, and grow, we need a visceral feeling of safety. No doctor can write a prescription for friendship and love. Mm -hmm. These are complex and hard-earned capacities. You don't need a history of trauma to feel self-conscious and even panicked at a party with strangers. But trauma can turn a whole world, the whole world into a gathering of aliens. Mm -hmm. This is not just about surrounding yourself by people. I know even, even without 
the context of trauma, we all have that experience of being surrounded by people and feeling really alone. But trauma can make you feel like that all the time. So that's why that social support, first and foremost, is such a huge path to healing. And it's why I think there's a lot of of group therapies for people to, to relate to other people who understand what they're going through and make them feel less alone. Um, at its core, healing trauma, like we've talked about a lot of times, also has so much to do with integrating it into your past. So here's an interesting little tidbit on that. In 1986, my colleagues and I wrote up the case of a woman who'd been a cigarette girl at Boston's Coconut Grove nightclub when it burned down in 1942. During the 1970s and 80s, she annually reenacted her escape on Newbury Street, a few blocks from the original location, which resulted in her being hospitalized with diagnoses like schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. I don't think she reenacted it consciously. Yeah. Like, I don't think it was intentional. Yeah. Um, in 1989, I reported on a Vietnam veteran who yearly staged an armed robbery on the exact anniversary of a buddy's death. He would put a finger in his pants pocket, claim that it was a pistol, and tell a shopkeeper to empty his cash register, giving him plenty of time to alert the police. This unconscious attempt to commit suicide by cop came to an end after a judge referred the veteran to me for treatment. Mm -hmm. Once we dealt with his guilt about his friend's death, there were no further reenactments. Yeah. Such incidents raise a critical question. How can doctors, police officers, or social workers recognize that someone is suffering from traumatic stress as long as he reenacts rather than remembers? How can patients themselves identify the source of their behavior? If their history is not known, they are likely to be labeled as crazy or punished as criminals rather than helped to integrate the past. I think this happens all the time. All the time. I our mean, prisons, our prisons are full of these people. And, and homeless shelters yes. full of people who are suffering from trauma and don't know how to integrate it. And they're reenacting it. Yes, over and over again. It's, yeah. it's heartbreaking. Yeah. So that's why healing has so much to do with integration is that when, because again, that veteran when he was able to process his feelings about his friend's death, he stopped reenacting. Yep. It became something that happened a long time ago as opposed to something that he was still compelled by today. Mm -hmm. But in order, I mean, thankfully, it sounds like that example was someone who was willing to explore well, and, that. Well, and he got the right help. I mean, he was exactly. referred to the trauma expert. But you do have to be mentally and, I mean, even physically you do. receptive to being able to integrate those past traumas in order to heal from it. And some people that's are why just not open to that. And that's, that's why they're so stuck. Well, not open, but they don't even realize it. Yep. Like, you have to be able to be receptive to integrating it or else you're just going to be perpetually, like, frozen in time. Okay, so along those lines... As the previous parts of this book have shown, the engines of post-traumatic reactions are located in the emotional brain. In contrast with the rational brain, which expresses itself in thoughts, the emotional brain manifests itself in physical reactions, gut-wrenching sensations, heart pounding, breathing becoming fast and shallow, feelings of heartbreak, speaking with an uptight and reedy voice, and the characteristic body movements that signify collapse, rigidity, rage, or defensiveness. Why can't we just be reasonable? And can understanding help? The rational executive brain is good at helping us understand where feelings come from. As in, I get scared when I get close to a guy because my father molested me, or I have trouble expressing my love toward my son because I feel guilty about having killed a child in Iraq. However, the rational brain cannot abolish emotions, sensations, or thoughts such as living with a low-level sense of threat or feeling that you are fundamentally a terrible person, even though you rashly know that you're not to blame for having been raped. Understanding why you feel a certain way does not change how you feel, but it can keep you from surrendering to intense reactions. For example, assaulting a boss who reminds you of a perpetrator, breaking up with a lover at your first disagreement, or jumping into the arms of a stranger. However, the more frazzled we are, the more our rational brains take a backseat to our emotions. Yeah. Intellectual understanding is never enough. No. It helps. It helps it you can put help. pieces together, but it's it doesn't change the emotional and physical responses. So um, I want to continue on that note with something he says about the limbic system, which is the system that kind of controls your emotions when it comes to, you know, trying to integrate 
The fundamental issue in resolving traumatic stress is to restore the proper balance between the rational and emotional brains so that you can feel in charge of how you respond and how you conduct your life. When we're triggered into states of hyper or hypo, which would be like less than Mm -hmm. arousal, we're pushed outside our window of tolerance, the range of optimal functioning. We become reactive and disorganized. Our filters stop working, so sounds and lights bother us. Unwanted images from the past intrude on our minds, and we panic or fly into rages. If we're shut down, we feel numb in our body and mind. Our thinking becomes sluggish, and we have trouble getting out of our chairs. As long as people are either hyper-aroused or shut down, they cannot learn from experience. Even if they manage to stay in control, they become so uptight, Alcoholics Anonymous calls this white-knuckle sobriety, that they are inflexible, stubborn, and depressed. Recovery from trauma involves the restoration of executive functioning and with it, self-confidence and the capacity for playfulness and creativity. If we want to change post-traumatic reactions, we have to access the emotional brain and do limbic system therapy, repairing faulty alarm systems and restoring the emotional brain to its ordinary job of being a quiet background presence that takes care of the housekeeping of the body, ensuring that you eat, sleep, connect with intimate partners, protect your children, and defend against danger. So the next section then we're going to get into is like, how do we bridge that gap between mind and body and get them back in sync? Yes. Because you that's clearly the problem. Again, it's a holistic process. And he has some very, he has some very good suggestions that have all been very well researched that he has implemented himself many times for how to do that, how to get your body and your mind and your emotional system, everything back in sync. So that's what we're getting into now. Here are some different yeah. ways <laughs> that are, you know, some are going to be more relevant to, to certain types of trauma than others. Some are going to be more personally, you'll be more receptive, but all of these are things that he has tested. Okay, the first one is just this, as simple as it gets. Breathing. Breathing. Uh, yeah, I mean, think about how many mindful breathing techniques there are. There's mm-hmm. box breathing. Have you heard of box breathing? That's when you do like mm-hmm. one, two, three, four, and then you kind of imagine the line going, like, it's like a box, right? Like yes, you do I think you breathe down, in for out, a certain count. You hold it hold for it. four, you... You exhale for four, you hold it for four, you inhale for four. Box breathing. Yes. Um, But you know, but like, calming the regular. There's a lot of, yeah, calming because something I learned in this book, um, because truly, one of my top symptoms of anxiety is not being able to take a deep breath. Mm -hmm. I literally spent years not being able to take a deep breath. In hindsight, oh, I should have done some trauma work a lot earlier. Mm -hmm. I should have done breathing. I should have done meditation. I should have done, um, some of the things we're going to get into in a second. Um, but I didn't know. I just had no idea it wasn't normal. Like mm-hmm. I lived with it for so long. I didn't know it wasn't normal. Well, he actually says that about a lot of trauma patients right. is that they just don't even pay attention to their breath. So when he asks them right. to, to start focusing on their breathing in and out slowly, it's a very it's weird. alien yeah. sensation to them. Now I have a much, much, much like, like more astute take, like, like able to, I'm able to discern how I feel a lot better then because I'm not over, I'm not constantly, I think my limbic system has calmed down to a degree so that I can actually sense when I'm feeling panicked instead of just feeling panicked all the time. Mm -hmm. If you're feeling panicked all the time, you don't have any contrast. If you want to have a a very, very short but powerful experiment with this, just pause this for a few seconds and take 10 deep Like into your diaphragm. Like down to the bottom of your lungs, in and out, 10 deep breaths. And then see how you feel. One of the things that he says, which I didn't know, was that when you breathe in, you activate the um, sympathetic nervous system, Mm -hmm. which is like the hyper, which is like the arousal state. I didn't realize that. It's the out breath Mm -hmm. that calms you down. It's the parasympathetic. Which is why, and we're going to talk about yoga more because that's one of the things he suggests. In yoga, oftentimes they'll have you do a longer out breath. I didn't know that. Than an in breath. I didn't know that either, but that's what came to mind. I was like, oh, no wonder. That's why they do it because that's the more calming part of the breath. So speaking of yoga and like intentional movement, that's another. So in addition to breathing, intentional movement is a really big one. Um, He says the body is physically restricted when emotions are bound up inside. People's shoulders tighten, their facial muscles, their facial muscles, their facial muscles tense. They spend enormous energy on holding back their tears or any sound or movement that might betray their inner state. When the physical tension is released, the feelings can be released. Movement helps breathing to become deeper, and as the tensions are released, expressive sounds can be discharged. 
the body becomes freer, breathing freer, being in flow. Touch makes it possible to live in a body that can move in response to being moved. I like that. Mm -hmm. People who are terrified need to get a sense of where their bodies are in space and of their boundaries. Firm and reassuring touch lets them know where their boundaries are, what's outside them, where their bodies end. They discover that they don't constantly have to wonder who and where they are. They discover that their body is solid and that they don't have to be constantly on guard. Touch lets them know that they are safe. Mm -hmm. This kind of combines this and touch, which we talk about, which is another thing on this list. Massage would be a great example of touch. Like Mm -hmm. use massage as a way of helping some traumatized people very slowly and safely like start to literally feel their bodies again. Remember how we talked about alexithemia and not being able to sense yourself? Like that actually physically can show up and not being able to have a good sense of how you feel. And so massage and um, intentional movement like yoga can help you literally get back into your body and start and not only calm down your nervous system, but help you actually start sensing yourself more fully. Yes. Well, and and again, everything that he suggests here has been very well proven, often by research by that, he's, yeah. that he's conducted. So to prove this, um, particularly about yoga, 10 weeks of yoga practice significantly reduced PTSD symptoms of patients who had failed to respond to any other medication or other treatment. So yeah. they tried all kinds of stuff. And it was yoga that yeah. made the biggest difference. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? That is truly amazing. I mean, it just shows what a what a physiological difference it can make to be intentional in your movement and breath. Because again, yeah. yoga's, yoga is intentional movement and there's a lot of breath work that goes into that. So intentional, kind of purpose. intentional movement could be all sorts of like physical practices that kind of combine mind, body, spirit, you mm-hmm. know? He Um, talks about Tai Chi. Pilates. mm -hmm, There's mm -hmm. a lot of them. So there's not just one way. Yoga is not the only option. Um, I feel like swimming would be a really good one because you have to be very intentional with your breath. Yes. When you swim. And it's also like a full body and it's like calming. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so that could be an intentional That's why I think a lot of, he mentioned different types of martial arts as well. Sure. I think a lot of breath work is involved in some of that. So you can kind of see some patterns here. Yeah. Um, Another one is mindfulness, which... Really, it's just the state of being present and focusing on what's like being very present to what's going on in your immediate circumstances. And Mm -hmm. it helps calm your nervous system down by because it's not focusing on the past. It's not focusing on the future. We're just focusing on how does it feel to chew like chew this food? Like what are the sensations that are coming up? Obviously, meditation. I was going to say, I think a lot of times people... Uh, use mindfulness and meditation almost, uh, you know, as synonyms. They're not the same thing. They're not really the same thing. I'm sure he, I'm sure he would say meditation is absolutely a form of mindfulness. Yeah. But yeah, just anything that brings you back into the present moment. So focusing on the physical kind of stimuli around you yeah. and where you are and what's going on right now and not being pulled into the past or the future. That's all considered um, mindfulness. I Liz Gilbert did a mindfulness thing on Instagram a few months ago, at like, co- like closer to the beginning of the pandemic. And it was, I was like, this is such a great mindfulness practice. It was like, name three things you, five things you can hear right now. Mm-hmm. Four things, maybe it was five things you can see, four things you can hear three things you can touch, you can feel, Mm -hmm. two things you can smell, and like one thing that you can like taste or something like that. Mm -hmm. I don't know. But it was like, it was like getting you back in touch with all of your senses. And by the time you're done with that, you're here. You know what I mean? You're You're not where you were. You're not where you were. Mm -hmm. I loved that. This next one I think is fascinating. Really really fascinating. Yeah. And the category here, there's a lot of variations of it, but the category he's calling group synchrony. So there's a lot of power in attuning to the energy of other people. And oftentimes that's very scary for people who have been traumatized because sure. other people have been dangerous. Yeah. So getting them back into attuning to others. Well, energy. Like in that communal kind of tribe, like, and in like the most deep kind of, you know how like birds flock together and they have that sort of rhythm. They have a rhythm that like mm-hmm. teaches them how to like fly in a V for like for geese. Like people yeah. have... There's some magic that happens when people attune to each other in a group too. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the, so he gives many examples of this. Singing, like choral singing is a big one. Or dancing. Dancing. Mm -hmm. Which could be an intentional movement on your own or you could do it in a group and that would be some group synchrony there. Um, And he spends actually 
a good amount of time talking about theater. Like a whole, like a whole chapter talking about theater. Yeah. Which I thought I never I put loved that together. It. I know you I did. I loved You it. loved theater in well, high school. Well, but now I'm like, oh my God. And, the best and chorus, I ever loved felt, both. the best I ever felt in high school was I, when I was on a stage. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh, yeah, I didn't so have any anxiety or trauma. I was just like feeling so good when right. I was on a stage. And think about this. This makes sense, right? First of all, you are tuning to other people's energy, but in a very safe space, you're able to act things out with a little bit of separation from it being you. Yeah. But you still get to get a lot of the emotions out and a lot of the sensations out, but in a safer way. So it makes a lot of sense. It's it's safe to experience feelings that aren't necessarily yours, even though like they probably kind of are yours. Yeah. But to tap on emotions to inform a character. a character. Yes. It's safe. And exploring conflict between your character and someone else's character. But again, it's not really you and them. You just get yeah. to play those roles it can be really, really healing. Yeah. This is... um. It does make me wonder about a lot of actors. I yeah. wonder if they're drawn, if, if some of them are drawn to it because it's almost like self-medication for healing. Yeah. They've well, discovered he that about, it really helps them. He talks about how in ancient Greece, like that there's a big theory. I mean, almost everyone had to, was like obligated to serve in the army in ancient Greece. And that, you know, obviously ancient Greece is where like theater was born. And that, you know, that there's a, there's like a whole book about the theater of war and how it helped probably soldiers act out and also the audience to have like that catharsis around the trauma and the experiences that they'd all gone through. Mm-hmm. Didn't he say that the the theater was mandatory too? Like everyone, I don't know that you had to go Something like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like a group catharsis, <laughs> emotional yeah. healing because there was so much trauma back then too. Um, we talked about touch a little bit already, but yeah. that can really help people get back in touch with their body, especially if their body has not felt like a safe space. If you've dissociated from your body in some mm-hmm. way, touch can be mm-hmm. a really great way to get back. Obviously, that's going to be primarily relevant for physical abuse of some kind, where maybe yeah. you learned to move out of your body. But really, any trauma no. can ask you to do that. I don't know. I feel like even if you're living in like a verbally abusive environment, you might just like mentally kind of mentally fly away. Mentally clock out, mm-hmm. yeah, and like mm-hmm. leave your body behind. Yeah, so again, massage is a really great way of having like, you know, safe, and relaxing touch to kind of calm down your body while it's being touched. Yeah. Um, so that can be that can be good. But it it's like slow build. All of these things you kind of dip your toe in. And then another one is taking action. Remember how we said earlier that the degree to which something is traumatic has a lot to do with whether you could physically escape the situation or not? We talked about that at the very beginning of part one. Mm-hmm. He says, the best way to overcome ingrained patterns of submission is to restore a physical capacity to engage and defend. So like learning how to fight back. And it's, he gives some examples in the book of it's, it's so cathartic to be able to like envision the situation ending differently and you being able to like overcome it and fight it this time. And so martial arts is obviously a great, you know, like kickboxing and making you feel stronger and more empowered and more in control of the situation when previously you've been feeling trapped. Um, Yeah, so uh, he says the best way to overcome ingrained patterns of submission is to restore physical capacity to engage and defend. Yeah. Um, So there's a couple other really, really fascinating treatments that he describes. I didn't get into all of them. There were whole ones I just left right out of this outline because we we couldn't talk about. But I picked two. The two we mentioned I think are just... The most fascinating. I'm personally really fascinated by these. Yeah. And these are things that go beyond the body work we've been talking about and also beyond talk therapy, which of course, both of those are things he advocates for as well. The first one is called EMDR. Eye movement desensitization. What does R stand for? Uh, I'm not sure. I can't remember. Google it. (laughs) EMDR. (laughs) Which involves a practitioner guiding you through a series of questions while moving your eyes according to where their finger directs you to look. So you're kind of going through these, you're answering these questions, you're having these visualizations, and they're kind of directing your eyes where to look. So there's like this rapid eye movement that's going on. It's thought to be related to REM, as in REM sleep, the phase of sleep where dreaming occurs. Dreaming, you know, plays a major role in mood regulation and helps you integrate thoughts and memories. So this has a similar kind of effect to that. And 
I was amazed by the statistics that he was sharing yeah. about EMDR, where people after it a few works sessions, like as well as drugs, if not better. Well, but it's permanent. But it's permanent. It's like right. they did. They actually did multiple studies of people going through EMDR for yes. healing trauma, and then other, you know, other control groups going through um, drug treatments. And the EMDR patients, they had the sessions, and then most of them were just cured. And then as soon as the patients on the drug trials went off the drugs, they relapsed again. Yep. I'm like, who would have thought? And he, even he, <laughs> he was like, I was skeptical. It feels like, it feels like- Why are we moving our eyes like this? Yeah, why are you like wagging your finger in front of someone's eyes and making their eyes split around while they're talking about stuff? That seems very new agey and strange. But he's like, I don't know what to tell you. The results speak for themselves. It's really, yeah. really effective. Um, You know, I'll also just add that like, well, we, this works so well. And the next thing we're going to talk about also works really well. Um, why aren't they common practice? Right? Why aren't they as popular as all get out? I don't know. Think there, about how much the drug companies make. Uh, there was some study he referred to that the EMDR was considered such a laughable treatment to this study that they made that just the control group. And it worked the best. And it worked better than all the other groups, which I just loved. It's eye movement, desensitization, and reprocessing. Ah, That's okay. what it means. Just FYI. Um... Okay, the other one that I, I'm, I'm down. I'm gonna try this. I looked up where I can do this. This is how committed I am to trying this. Is neurofeedback, which involves basically nudging the brain to make more of some frequencies and less of others, which creates new patterns that enhance its natural complexity and its bias towards self regulate self regulation. So basically, you look, you get hooked up, you get some electrodes on your head. It sounds like it sounds science, like science fiction or something. <laughs> yeah, but, and I think, you know, you you get asked like questions and you, you know, like the practitioner, there's an art to it. It's not just a science. But the idea is that it sends new currents through your brain. Like it helps, it doesn't hurt. Like it's just, mm -hmm. um, but that it helps your brain to rewire and to stop defaulting to the same wiring. And this is super helpful if you are trying to make changes, but you're just like, stuck in a hyper aroused state. That's me. Like I intellectually know I don't have any reason to be anxious. There's literally nothing I need to be anxious about, but yeah, I feel anxious. And I'm like, that is because I am just like brain got wired that my way. Brain got wired and it's just, that way. That's and it's I, natural it's, state now. And I've done a lot of healing, but like, I feel like personally, I reached a bit of a plateau where I'm like, I could be less anxious, but I'm not sure that talking it out, I have to, if I could talk it out, I probably <laughs> would have by now, you know? Right. Right. Um, and I could probably do more yoga and more meditation and more breathing. But like, I'm really curious to try this because these, just like EMDR, the results of this are long lasting. They are permanent. Yes. They are like amazing. When you can rewire your brain, it stays that way. If Unless you get re-traumatized. You know, right. Of course, that right, makes right. sense. But I love this. Like mm -hmm. this is so much more um, cost effective than years of drugs or, um, you know, like, why would you take something for years and years if it's just going to stop working as soon as you stop taking it? Right, right. Then you become dependent on that to maintain the healing. Right. So, And those I, come with side effects. This doesn't come exactly, with any side effects. Exactly. Again, just such good proof of the holistic approach. So I'm sure he would advocate for finding whatever collection of things. So because maybe not everything some, works on everybody. Or you might need... You might need uh, to join some sort of group synchronized, you know, dance group and do some yoga to calm your breathing and get some talk therapy and rewire your brain, right? Like you might need you a multifaceted right. approach in order to get the long lasting But you might healing. not need all of those forever. You know what Exa I mean? Right. Right. You may need to start with one or two or add them on, but eventually it, if you heal then your body and mind are behaving as they are meant to. You won't necessarily need to be constantly managing yourself. That's what I find as someone who has been so like anxious, kind of depressive, and has struggled with that off and on my whole life, mostly on, um, is <laughs> it is so much work to be so easily triggered. Mm -hmm. It takes so much work to just take a deep breath sometimes. It is exhausting. Your body is exhausted by being in fight or flight all of the yeah, time. You have to expel a lot of energy trying to pull that back in check. And it, and like you get sick more often. You get headaches more often. You're mm -hmm. tense. Um, you can't sleep that well. I mean, everyone on this knows that I struggle with sleeping. Like, mm -hmm. and 
it just, it takes so much out of you to just like be a normal functioning person that what's left over is like, I can't, I feel like it's harder to make progress in life sometimes or to get as much work done as you might want to get done Mm -hmm. or to enjoy your life to the fullest. And so like, if you're going to be spending that much work in just managing your symptoms, Yes. Why are we not putting that energy that we're putting into managing our symptoms into actually healing ourselves and mm-hmm. doing things that actually work? And that's why I love that he's so committed to finding things that really and truly work, not just the next fad treatment, yeah. not just things that people say have been working forever, but actually don't do that much. He is committed to finding the things that have the biggest impact, whether they make any sense to him when he goes into it or not. And what I... What I took by, I mean, this was, to be honest, this was a hard book to read. There was times where I was like, oh, I don't know that I want to read this today because it's just intense. But by the end, when I was in this this treatment and healing section, I was just feeling so much more hopeful because there are stories of people with some of the worst things you can imagine happening to a human. And when they go through the right treatment sequence, they can be happy, really fully functional and, and happy. Yes. Yeah. And lead very normal, contented lives. And so for most of us who are not anywhere near that extreme in terms of not traumatic a 10 backgrounds, out of 10 on not the a 10 out of 10. ACE score. Right. We're more like in the medium to lower range. Then that just gives me so much more hope that that healing is really possible. And there are things that genuinely work. And he has seen it happen for people all across that spectrum. So just yeah. don't feel like you have to feel broken or anxious or depressed or, you know, mentally scattered forever. Yeah. Like there are things that you can do. And some of them are actually a lot more accessible yeah. than you might think. So if you've struggled with mental health or you know that you have trauma, then if you struggle with mental health, you probably do have trauma. Like I think we're finding the connection between those two things is not random. That no. trauma begets mental health issues. hmm um, then, and, and if what you've tried hasn't worked, I hope this book will inspire you to try something else because, you know, to kind of cap off this last section here about healing and integrating your trauma and, you know, moving on so much of, so much of this kind of, to me can be summed up by like, Well, here we go. He says it right here. Trauma causes people to remain stuck in interpreting the present in light of an unchanging past. So sometimes we're not consciously aware that we're experiencing the present through the lens of the past. But your body is. (laughs) Your body is always aware. So I want us to stop dismissing what our bodies are telling us. And if something's, you know, if we're experiencing chronic illness, anxiety, depression, confusion. It's not random. It makes perfect sense. And if what you've tried hasn't worked, if you've gone to therapy and it's just not working or... Or it worked to a point, but you still right. feel like there's unresolved Or you're taking med- medications, mm-hmm. but you don't feel like it's really helping, then maybe the answer here is that you need to become more receptive to healing and we need to work on your nervous system. We need to actually do a more holistic body-based approach to helping you heal, to helping you integrate Mm -hmm. that change. I love that. So I I just love this like mind, body, emotion connection he's talking about because I have so many clients who can understand why they are the way they are and why they feel the things that they feel, but it doesn't stop them from feeling it. So we really do need to address the physiological parts in addition to the intellectual understanding. Both are critical. Yeah. So that's why all these things that he's talking about are integrative. Yeah. Like that's, if you're, that's the underlying message here. We have to integrate. If if you want to really heal, you need to not only have someone, at least someone, if not a community of people who can support you and validate you and help you process like emotionally, intellectually, what you've been through, but you also need a physiological approach to calming down your nervous system, getting back in touch with your body, helping you... Um, you know, helping your body do what it's meant to do as opposed to reacting all the time, like calming down that alarm system. So I hope that this has been revelatory because it was for me and Mm -hmm. it's given me like a homework assignment. I really, I like Googled neurofeedback in my area and I found a clinic and I'm like, I don't know how much this costs, but I am going to go (laughs) and try it out, I think, because why not? Mm -hmm. Like, I'd rather spend money on that than anything else. Yeah. Get my brain even brighter. (laughs) 
Maybe get my well, grammar right, This was right one too. of the more scientific <laughs> topics we've gotten into. No wonder my brain hurts. I'm uh, like, I'm I, not used to this level of scientific I processing. I feel like this has been, and I feel like some of the people listening might feel like this has been a, an intellectual, maybe emotional roller coaster, um, but for very, very good purpose. And I hope, I hope a lot of people feel seen through this and yeah. feel validated and feel like there's hope if you have been feeling stuck. Yeah. I would love to hear your comments on this. Mm -hmm. Um, I will also remember, I will will link to it in the show notes of this episode and part one, that adverse childhood experiences quiz. That would be a really good place for you to start, I think, is to take that ACEs quiz and figure out just how traumatized am I? Yeah. And, and you don't have to it's share that person. necessarily. No, we'd please love, don't share that. We'd love you for you to, to share comments on things that, you know, were relevant or questions that you might have. Um, One other thought is take the ACE quiz for, some, you know, thinking about someone in you in your life who you think might be struggling with trauma. As best you know for that. Yeah, Ella, you might not least. be able to actually answer, but like using, you, you know, a lot of people have parents that they can probably mm-hmm. kind of, all right, I know, know their almost everything history, about yeah. that person's history. And not that you can necessarily do anything about it, because if the person's not receptive, they're not receptive. But it can certainly help you understand them in a new light and have empathy for them and understand why, you know, if if you have a mom who um, was not able to be attuned to your needs and you um, maybe ended up kind of traumatized by proxy, Mm -hmm. it might help you understand why. It might help you give more context for why you struggled when you, quote unquote, had a great life and good parents, that kind of thing. Because I think a lot of people struggle with that. Yeah. It's like, well, why do I feel so anxious or depressed? Or why am I struggling so much when I haven't had any bad things happen to me? And well, it, your parents might. Yes. And it, honestly, it makes sense because a lot of our the, our parents' generation and older generations, uh, this wasn't even something you could talk about. So there was right. so much trauma and a lot of unprocessed trauma human that history, gets passed down. Trauma has been a component of human history for the for day one, since day about one. the number of wars and violence. I mean, just so, so much. That right. Is Addicts, in history. alcoholics. Yeah. Um, so he has a very good chance that there's some trauma that's been passed down and it doesn't make it okay or anything, but it does make you understand and have a little bit of compassion. Yeah. Um, that might lead to some forgiveness, which is also healing. Okay. Wow. Whew. Okay. That was a big one. Um, We will be back, I believe, next Friday. New Dear Crachel. New Dear Crachel. Okay. Much lighter note next week. (laughs) Well, I don't think anyone's going to ask us any questions that are quite this heavy. I doubt it. (laughs) So, all right. Leave a comment and we will see you on Friday. Bye.